recording has begun. Alrighty, we'll give it one more minute and we'll start at the top of the hour here. All right, well, good afternoon and happy pre-Friday. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to the first HSD Lunch and Learn of the 2022-2023 season. My name is Michael Bailey and I have the pleasure of Michael, you went on mute. You have a had the pleasure of. Oh, ah, thank you. <laughs> My name is Michael Bailey, and I have the pleasure of serving as the deputy director here at the Seattle Human Services Department. I am extremely excited to help kick off today's event, and I look forward to the other events that we're going to be having throughout the year. At a high level, these events provide ample opportunity to one highlight issues that are important to the people that we serve and collaborate with, two, provide valuable information to our attendees that could be used to benefit you, your friends, your family, and our communities, and three, to showcase some of the amazing work that Team HSD is doing to advance our One Seattle mission and how we're collaborating with our community partners to sustain and scale our impact. If you're here at Team HSD, I hope you notice my offer in the meeting invite. The HSD division with the best attendance today will receive donuts. Um, donuts delivered by the executive team here at HSD. Our phenomenal Manuel, uh, yeah. who works with our legislative and external affairs team, will be reviewing the attendance log and will help to identify the winning division. And once that winner is identified, we'll notify the department uh, just for bragging rights and we'll collaborate with the appropriate division director on where and when to deliver the donuts. And while this is an internal HSD event, we recognize that we have some of our city partners attending today. That being said, I want to recognize the attendance of some of our aging and disability partners, mainly Seattle Fire, EMS, and King County Elder Abuse Coalition. Thank you for your partnership. Now, I've set the tone for today. I want to introduce Mary Pat. And to keep things fun, I want to provide a few fun facts about Mary. Uh, many of you know Mary, and I just want to add that in addition to serving as a division planner, Mary is also a registered nurse. Uh, Mary Pat hails from the great state of North Dakota, which I hear is the best of the Dakotas, but I'll let Mary weigh in on that. And uh, Mary has supported ADS for over 26 years. So basically, Mary is a true public servant, and I personally feel blessed to have the opportunity to work with her. Mary Pat will share her expertise in falls prevention, and she's going to introduce some amazing guests. So together, they're going to tell you a little bit about how people can avoid broken bones, uh, traumatic experiences, and potentially um, worse conditions as well. So Mary Pat, I've taken up more than enough time. I am ha highly caffeinated. Uh, so I'm excited to hear what you and other folks have to say. Uh, Mary Pat, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. I am pleased to talk about fall prevention, which is very near and dear to my heart. And yes, North Dakota is the better of the Dakotas. And um, I will say that I am a fall injury survivor, having sustained a brain injury in 2016. Uh, falls are near and dear to my heart, and um, I've been involved at the Washington state level, the county level, and also uh, locally with our King County uh, Fall Coalition. I am so thrilled and pleased today to be joined by two experts in their respective fields. First, we're going to hear from Kelly Murden. She is an award-winning, nationally recognized physical therapist who received the Physical Therapist of the Year Award by the state's chapter of the Washington State Physical Therapist in 2019. She is passionate, energetic, and a true advocate for geriatric physical therapy. Kelly, the virtual stage is yours. You're on mute, Kelly. That's a bad. Okay. 
How about now? Yeah? Okay, take two. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mary Pat. I'm very honored to be here. I want to thank the Seattle Human Service Department for having me, for inviting me here. This is such an important topic. I'm so grateful to have an audience to share about it um, because falls are a big deal um, and something that we, we all need to be considerate of, especially in the work that we all do. Um, I don't have much time and I have a lot I want to cover. And I really, the purpose of my presentation is to give you a ton of um, resources. So I'm not going to go through every, every slide word by word so that you understand it. I hope that you have access to this information and can come back to it later to, to really dig in. Um, so forgive me for not going through each slide, but I wanted to make sure you had these resources for at your fingertips. Okay, so let's jump in. The, um, Falls are not just an old age issue, right? So that's my first thought is that I think that's a, a pre-misconception often is that, well, I'll deal with that when I get older. Well, I think all of us need to be mindful of the things that I'm about to cover because there's a lot of risk factors that are all present for us or maybe our loved ones or the people that you work for and having an awareness of what risk factors are for falls, no matter where you are on the spectrum of age is really important. So I think you would be a better service to your people you care for um, and be better prepared for yourself um, by understanding some of these things. Okay, next slide. So just to kind of bring that home, here's some examples of people that had some falls that um, maybe you're familiar with. How about Ann B. Davis? She fell in the bathtub, sustained a coma, and passed away. So she died from a fall. And then Dave Friedman, he wrote that 100 Things to Do Before You Die. He fell at home, hit his head, and passed away from that injury. And Eddie Arnold, he had a broken hip, so he was in a skilled nursing facility. And at that facility, he had a fall and passed away. So again, the point of this slide is just as a reminder, it's not just older adults who are at risk of falls and the injuries and deaths sustained from those. So that's the point. I just want to reiterate that a little bit just to kind of get your attention that we all need to understand these, these factors to apply to ourselves. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> fall risk, I think the reason we're here, I think it's pretty exciting that it's fall, National Fall and Injury Prevention Week. That's what's bringing us here today. Um, and we're all here to kind of learn and do our part to reduce falls and their devastating impact. So um, I'm not going to read all of these slides, but I just the biggest thing you're going to take home is falls are the leading cause of injury related um, ER visits in our with for our older adults, and they can be more dangerous than we think. Um, so let's talk a little bit more deeply into that. Okay. Next slide. So starting with um, King County. So this is data that the Department of Health put out. So this slide is talking about the leading injury related deaths by mechanism. So people who died from a fall, where did that fall happen or how did that, I'm sorry, injury happen? For falls c covered 44% of all the injury related deaths. That's a almost half. So that's a big percentage. So this is a big deal. This is something that really impacts a lot of people. Okay, next slide. The next slide you're going to see what I want you to take away from this. Just lean back. That's a positive trend. It's getting worse. That's that's the big point here. This is 20 years of data that you see in front of you that line and it's continuing to go up. So the number of fall related deaths among King County residents 60 and older continues to get worse and it's gotten worse by 7% in just one year from 20 to 2021. And I don't think COVID is going to make this line improve. So it's a it's a trend. It's a it's getting worse. Um, and we also know that our population numbers are also increasing so that the number of people is going to also increase. So that's why we're here. That's why we all want to improve our skills in this area. Next slide. The, this next slide is telling you th this takeaway is where do these falls happen? These fall related deaths. Most of them are at home. And I think there's a lot of people as they get older, they tie in to pull in their activity. Well, I just won't go to that place and that place has gravel or there's a stairs there. So I'm just going to stay home. Well, this slide, I think, speaks to the fact that's not helpful, actually. Instead, what we need to have people understand is there's a multi-dimensional factor to fall risk. Like what puts you at risk for a fall is complicated. So let's dig into those areas instead of limiting your activity to home, because that's where most of them actually do occur. So that's the point of this slide. Um, on the next slide, um, just speaks to um, a little bit about King County residents with dementia or Alzheimer's. There we go. Um, account for 24% of 
fall related hospitalizations. So the, as a smaller part of our older adult population, they make up a quarter of those hospitalizations. So a significant number. So just remember that cognitive impairment does also impact your increased risk of falling. Um, so I know that we have a dementia action uh, collaborative in the area that is well aware of these, these risk factors. So just wanted to highlight that as well for you. Um, if you're working with someone who has a cognitive impairment, that of itself also does increase their risk of falls. Next slide. <clears throat> Point of this slide is <clears throat> hospital discharge location. So I had a fall, I had to go to the hospital, and after I leave, I where do I go from there? And what you see on the red box is that 45% um, of these people um, were discharged to a long-term care facility. There we go. And uh, what that means is almost half of the people who went to the hospital because of a fall go to some kind of a nursing home. That's a devastating, life-changing event for them. So Again, just recognizing the impacts of, of falls and, and their significance. And if you look along the, the green and yellow bars for our black, uh, the pe black people, non-Hispanic, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, those numbers increase. So very impactful, especially and if you go down the socioeconomic time for, uh, frame, that is going to be even more impactful to their life because they don't have the resources to cover a lot of this long-term care facilities. Okay, next slide is just a bunch of fall facts. There's a lot of information on this slide. I don't need to read it all to you. Again, I, I want you to take this and dig in later. But the takeaway is falls are common and falls are costly. They're costly both financially and otherwise, um, the impact they have on people's lives. And again, these trends are continuing and to continuing to get worse. So that's why we're here is to what can we do and gain our own skill in supporting um, fall prevention. The next slide talks about just let's define a fall. What, what do we mean by fall? Because I think that there's some differences in how my mom wants to define a fall and how I want to define a fall. So landing on the ground or some lower surface when you didn't intend to be there, that's the definition of a fall. And this does include slips and trips, mom. Um, and accidents like if you got hit by a scooter or a shopping cart from someone else, those aren't considered a fall. Um, and you don't exactly have to land on the ground to be considered as a fall. So if you go to stand up from a chair, you lose your balance and you fall back into the chair, that is considered a fall. So I was surprised when I first read this because I don't think my mother would consider all of those things on this slide a fall. So again, just keeping that in perspective um, for to make sure that we're all coming from the same place. Okay, next slide. Um, so, Yes, so the next factors that we're going to talk about is let's move a little bit more into risk factors for falls. So I've talked about how the nitty gritty, the, the doom and gloom of falls. So what can we do about it? So well, let's learn about some risk factors. So next slide. Um, falling and fear of falling is not a normal part of aging. I think that's a really important thing to understand. I think there's so there's some, well, I'm 83. What else do you expect? I'm like, well, I would expect that you have the muscle strength and the balance stability to not fall. That is not an accepted normal process. So I think, again, that's a common misconception that instead we need to dig into what is it that's that for you specifically that is causing you to have an increased risk. So next slide shows us a lot of these different, what are the fall risk factors? And what, what you see is that research shows us that it's really a combined effect, kind of this interaction of these different areas that that is increases your risk of fall. So not all of us have all of these fall risk items, but we all have our own. And I think there's also interplay, like taking medic multiple medications might cause increased dizziness or muscle weakness may be related to my difficulty with balance. So there's interactions between the two, which makes it understandable that fall risk or fall prevention has to be multidimensional and it has to be able to be more nimble because it has to be specific to the person. Um, and I think that's what makes it more tricky. So on the next slide, another way of kind of breaking out these risk factors is there's physical risk factors. So that's the changes in your body that increase your risk for a fall. Like if you're inactive and you sit your legs will get weak and that'll put you at an increased risk. 
or behavioral factors are things that we can either do or we don't do that increase your risk of falls. So that could be climbing a ladder at 82 to clean the gutters, maybe not the best idea. Environmental things are, you know, my, my porch to my, the front of my house has no railings at all or tubs that are deep and don't have grab bars. Those are environmental factors. So kind of thinking about how do we group these things might help us understand or really dig into what applies to you or your people that you care for. So the next slide just kind of digs in a little bit more to that physical risk factors. Of course, as a PT, this is where I spend most of my time. Um, but, you know, we all have different types of physical risk, risk factors. Some we can control and some we can't. So our challenge today is to improve those factors that we can change. We can become more physically active. We can improve our home env environment. We can have it evaluated. Get your vision checked. Ch check your medications. Um, all of those things would impact your risk your fall risk. Um, you can deal with the fear of falling through education. We have some ev evidence-based programs, I think of matter of balance, kind of educate you about what is true fall prevention, um, improve exer with exercise. There's lots of things we can do. So just wanted to give you a little bit more on um, the physical part. And the next slide, we have um, Yip No. We'll, we'll talk to you later. She's a um pharmacist and she's the expert, but I medications is one of the fall risk areas, but I will let her give you a lot more specific information at the end of this presentation. But in general, just know one of the key areas of is just multiple medications. Um, and here are some ideas about ways that you could reduce some of these uh, key areas for medication mismanagement that increases fall risk. Um, but I'll let uh, Yip give you even more detail later. Um, another area of fall risk, next slide, is uh, hearing. Did you know that people with mild hearing loss are three times more likely to fall? I thought that was pretty interesting. That's a pretty significant, three times the, the, the likelihood. That's a significant amount. So when was the last time you had your ears checked? I can't remember when last time I had my hearing checked. So, you know, thinking about my mom or, or your, people in your life that you might want to ask that question, because I don't think it's as common as my dental appointment or my annual exam with my physician. I think the hearing isn't quite as frequent, so something to consider. Remember that that is a risk. Next slide tells us that vision and uh, is a fall risk. Um, I think it's really important to have an eye exam after after the age of 50 every year. So if you do have visual problems from diabetes, glaucoma, macular degeneration, or other eye problems, you really, really should see your doctor more than once a year. You know, when we first start wearing bifocals or trifocals or those progressive lenses, it really takes some time on how you learn to kind of navigate your your world, and particularly true when you're going up and down steps or curbs, you know, you might want to hold on to someone or a handrail. You may need to choose to use a, um, a ramp instead. Um, but these are things I just think us as care providers or family members um, being aware of and talking about with, with people, I think is a really important area to kind of tease out when we're talking about fall prevention. The next slide tells you about um, blood pressure, another common area. Um, and so the first question is, how do you have your blood pressure checked regularly? Um, and you should uh, talk to your doctor about how often should I be checking my own blood pressure? Um, I think one of the uh, m more significant uh, areas is when you get dizzy when you stand up, that, hypo that orthostatic hypotension. Um, and I think that's, that's a common problem. And also when you have Blood pressure, blood pressure medications, very common. Um, when you change the dosage of those things, th when your body's still adapting to those changes, that can affect your sense of dizziness when you change positions. So, you know, go moving slowly as you transition between a seated and a standing position, counting to three before you start moving, things like that are some good tips. And I have on here um, the link to a, um, this brochure. CDC has wonderful uh, fall prevention um, brochures. Here's the link to this one that's specific to postural hypertension. Next slide. Um, some more fall risk areas are chronic conditions. So diabetes, arthritis, stroke, you know, these chronic conditions impact falls in different ways. Diabetes maybe alters the sensation in your foot. Arthritis could cause you to walk um, with maybe a more stooped posture because you're painful. Stroke increases weakness on one side that may affect your ability to catch yourself on that side. So all these areas have their different ways of impacting your fall. So being aware that the, you should kind of go through this checklist with people and remember that 
discuss that what area, how does that particularly impact that person? Next slide. One more area is an environmental recommendation. So that home situation, how's your lighting? How are your throw rugs? You know, a lot of these these areas. Again, the CDC has a great um, uh, this check for safety uh, brochure that the link is on here um, and well, the links are also aggregated at the end of this presentation for you to find them a little bit more easily. Um, but this you can have someone uh, OT or PT come assess someone's home to kind of Give, do a safety check um, assessment. Um, Yip has a, no, a really nice checklist at the end of her in her presentation also as doing some environmental um, assessments, but that's another area that should be considered. OK, next slide. Moving into the now what? So we've talked about risk factors, so let's move into prevention. So next slide. The first question is, um, are, are falls preventable? Can, what can we do about them? Um, and I think you know, the fact that you hear someone, oh, she fell, that can have a huge impact on us. So what can we do about it? And I think, yes, the answer is yes, they are preventable. So let's talk about how. Um, next slide. Here we see the study. The study uh, is from the CDC and it has a toolkit that's created by the American Geriatric and British Geriatric Society. This is their clinical pro process on how they uh, identify fall risk. So screen, assess, intervene, kind of three general areas. To screen, we're going to ask questions. There's a there's some uh, brochures for uh, how, many, how many falls have you had? I think there's three main questions about, do you feel unsteady? Have you fallen? Um, and do you worry about falls? And then to assess, okay, from there, um, what 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 areas do we need to dig deeper into? And then what are we going to do about it for intervene? If we go to the next slide, all this is is just more detail. Uh, this is available to you. You can go and um, download this for free. It just tells you really specifically when we talk about screen, what, is, what are they talking about? And these are the experts from across the world giving you guidance on how, how do I in, look into fall risk for my, my patient or my client or my family member. So I just want you to have these tools, how to screen, how to assess, how to intervene. Uh, that's what that slide is for. And then the next slide, again, just giving you more resources. Like what if I know somebody who has some poor balance or that has um, maybe some depth perception um, problems? What are some things I can do about it? That's what this slide is trying to help you with. Um, and the next slide, I just want you to know that the study toolkit from the CDC has wonderful brochures that dig deeper into this that you can print for free. I gave you the link there. Um, so I just wanted you to have access to some of these resources um, if you wanted to educate um, someone about them or, or learn for yourself. OK, the next slide is just kind of a summary slide of what can you do to pre prevent falls? And if we had to wrap it all into to four key things, this is what the CDC would recommend. Exercise, pharmacist, vision, and get your home and make sure your home is safe. So those are kind of the four key areas that we need to uh, make sure that we address if we are thinking to improve the fall risk for someone. Um, and again, the link to those is uh, is on that slide for you. Um, and that's just a nice summary of the key. That's not all of them, but th those are kind of the four key ones. OK. Shift into evidence based programs. Next slide. OK, so this is kind of my meat and potatoes. This is where I live and I know I'm moving fast. Um, I hope we have time for questions at the end, but I'm just trying to give you as much information as we can in our brief time together. So let's talk about the fall, the evidence based fall prevention program. So next slide here is just um, uh, kind of a list of what I felt like was the most common ones in, in Washington state. And these are ones that the CDC has kind of given that stamp of approval that these programs have been shown through research through a pretty rigorous process to be um, deemed fall prevention intervention programs by the CDC. So matter of balance, enhanced fitness, Otago, Taiji Kwan, and SAIL. Those are kind of, I think, if uh, they're all available in Washington state and they have been proven to reduce falls. Um, so I want to make sure you know that those are kind of a good good starting point. And there's many more on the list from CDC, but I felt like these were a good starting point for us um, here at Washington State. The next slide just wants to give you, OK, so if I want to go to some of those evidence based programs, how do I find them? Well, community living connections is a great place to start. Your health care provider, um, ask your primary care doctor. Senior centers often have wonderful programs. YMCA, I think of Silver Sneakers, commonly at YMCA. 
online? Is it oodles of, of videos available? We're going to watch a video in a moment about um, Otago, and that came from YouTube. Um, it's a free video as well. The PBS has that wonderful sit and fit that's been around for a long time, um, but it's a great program. And one of the handouts that, you, that are available for you is the King County Fall Prevention Resource. Um, that one is just local to King County. What are some of these um, fall prevention resources? So that's a handout available that the King County Fall Coalition put together um, a couple years ago as a resource. So want you to know where to go next. And this is more from a bigger picture nationally. If you wanted more information about evidence-based resources, this is from a national level. So this is kind of pulling back a little bit. Did I say Vince? Oh, next slide, sorry. This one, this is the national level. So if you wanted to, to look at some maybe some that weren't available in Washington state, where could you find those? That's what this slide is for. OK, next slide. Now we get to move into Otago and Otago is the evidence based program that I have most experience with. Um, and it is itself um, an evidence based. I just said that fall prevention program um, that came out of uh, New Zealand. So on the next slide, what Otago is uh, um, is 17 exercises um, and it has we have four categories one you have a warm-up we have five strengthening exercises and 12 balance exercises and there's also a walking program um, and the red boxes um, identify um, for you kind of what the secret sauce of, i think of otago what makes it uh, unique and effective and Otago, you have weights, and those weights are you make them progressively heavier. Um, I think that's a key part of why the strengthening program works. Um, there's most of the this the exercises are done in standing, all but one. I think that's an important factor. Um, and the balance exercises also a progress. So I have both hands. I go to one hand, and then I go to no hands. That progressive nature, I think, is also kind of part of what makes Otago so effective. Okay, now, um, Irene, if we could just go through these next slides pretty quickly. There's pictures of the, this is the warm up. We're going to watch a video of this, so we don't really need to dig in too much in these pictures, but I just wanted you to have access to them. These are the three strengthening exercises that have the weights. The next slide shows you other strengthening exercises just using body weight. And next slide shows me that here's the progressive nature of a balance. See, he's got two hands, then she in the middle has one, and the woman on the far right has no hands. So that's a progressive balance exercise. Next slide. Here was just supported and unsupported heel toe walking. So walking heel to toe, standing on one leg, just the progressive nature of this program. Next slide. And we have some squats and backward walking. Next slide and walking sideways, walking and turning around. The dynamic nature is great. And next slide. Stairs, like we just did that. Yep, keep going. Got a couple more slides. There we go. Now let's watch it. I think this is um, a better way to kind of see it. This is Tiffany Schubert. She's been a huge advocate and disseminator of this program. This video is about four minutes long, but I think you walk away understanding a lot more about Otago. Okay. The Otago Exercise Program is an evidence-based fall prevention program that was developed and tested at the University of Otago in New Zealand. That's where it gets its name from. Researchers found that when adults over the age of 65 did this prescribed set of exercises three times a week, that they fell 35% less than others that were receiving a placebo treatment. These exercises, when you do them, can really protect you against a fall by improving your leg strength and improving your balance. Before you start this program today, you should know that your participation is purely voluntary and you need to monitor yourself. If an exercise doesn't feel good or is painful, you really shouldn't do it and you should check with your healthcare provider before starting. The way we set up our program is that you will do a progression. You will do one session of the program for approximately two weeks or until you feel that the exercises have become easy. Once the exercises are easy, we'll make it more challenging by adding in more repetitions of the exercise or by making it more challenging for your balance by asking you to either not hold on, not use your hands at all, or other types of challenges. This really should be a fun program for you to do. 
and you will see that as you do the program that your legs get stronger and your balance improves. Ideally, you want to do the program three times a week for about 30 minutes. On days when you're not doing the exercise program, you should strongly consider incorporating a walking program in, also three times a week, working up to about 30 minutes. If you do this, strength training three times a week, walking three times a week, you will actually achieve the optimal dose of exercise to protect yourself against a fall, and you'll also be achieving the recommended, recommended dose of exercise by the American College of Sports Medicine for older adults. We strongly recommend is a set of ankle weights. So these are for three of the exercises. These are really, really important. If you feel that you're not quite strong enough yet to put on ankle weights and use them, I would challenge you to try ankle weights no matter, no matter what, even if it's just one pound or a half a pound. This extra weight, this extra resistance will really give you the greatest benefit when you're working on improving your strength and improving your balance. Okay, so um, now she's gonna show you some of these. So the, just the video can continue to play, but I just wanted to speak over it. Just again, these are the exercises you're gonna see. Um, she's gonna go through some of these. We'll see the warm up and some balance exercises and then some walking. Yeah, it looks like it's going. So yeah, just showing you that these are the three groups that we're about to see. Um, the font is very fuzzy. She's coming. There we go. OK, so this is the warm up. Um, just it's a pretty basic. Ooh, there's the neck trunk rotation, still part of the warm up. Standing up. Now this is the goes into the strengthening part. The only one that's seated. Standing. Still have weights on. Third one that has the weights on. Just use body weight. You know, they just target the key muscles for lower extremities for fall prevention. Squats, standing up. And she's doing it the hardest way. Tandem stance, walk. Standing on one leg, a key thing that we don't practice enough. Walking heel to toe, something most people try to avoid, but it's actually something a great skill to have. This is the figure eight walking that oftentimes we might need to do next to a wall. So they would have something to hold on to initially or do it with their walker. That would be acceptable to start, but we're trying to progress it away. Backwards walking tandem. Again, something that, that I think a lot of older adults would avoid doing, but it's a good challenge for them to, if they can do it safely. Great, that's the end of the video. You can go on to the next slide. So I just wanted the to Ocado kind of exercise program is give you that taste. I think some of us have never seen Otago, so hopefully now you have a better understanding of what it is. And here's some free um, resources that you can access. The video we just watched is the second bullet there. Um, so, uh, and to get trained in Otago, there's one that that course is, is there um, that, just to know that it was created for physical therapists, so it speaks to physical therapists. So next slide. Um, what I have done is taken Otago where Otago has been a physical therapist, has is working with a patient, and I prescribe these certain exercises for the patient to do at home, and then they discharge from therapy and they do it on their own. That's kind of been the, the, the traditional model, and what I found in the last six years doing this is that that's not enough. One-on-one -on -one isn't enough. We need to reach a, big, a wider space swath of people. So I what I do is I train people at a senior center or an assisted living to do in this exercise program and I oversee it as, as a physical therapist. So if you go to the next slide, this just kind of walks you through. So I come in and I train um, on the exercises and how to do the steady, how to do those to those assessments. We do pre and post test 
testing um, for our each of the individuals. I make modifications. That's where I feel like my role is, is what what, what do we need to tweak based on that fall risk? They participate in the exercise group for about eight weeks, twice a week. Um, I'm overseeing it and then I come back and we all do the, the post test results. And this has been a great format. It's worked really well in Snow Valley and we're expanding this year to do this further. So hopefully you'll be able to see more Otago groups in your area. Um, and next slide. Yes, just that. Yay, it was successful. And based on that, we're doing more. So this is what our flyer was for Snow Valley um, when we did this last year. So um, that is all I have. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Kelly. That was amazing. And as you all can see how exciting and dynamic Kelly is. Awesome, awesome, <laughs> awesome. And now I'm pleased to introduce you to Yip No, a pharmacy resident from Kelly Ross Pharmacy and a strong advocate for medication safety. She is a pharmacist with our senior drug education program. She graduated from University of Washington with, with a pharmacy degree with the Pline Certificate in Geriatrics. She's amazing um, also. We are so welcome to have you here. Yip, please take it away to the virtual stage. Thank you so much, Mary Pat, for those wonderful introductions. So for this next portion, I'll be going into some medications and how they're related to falls and then some ways that we can um, ad address those as well. I'll start with this slide. I have a few objectives really to describe the medication related risk factors for falls and then review prevention strategies for patients and then identify some helpful resources that you can provide to patients as well. So then on the next slide, we'll jump right into some of those medications that are associated with falls. And really, falls can occur with anyone, just like Kelly had mentioned before. Really, anyone can be um, affected by falls, and anyone can be on medications, and therefore can also be impacted by falls. And oftentimes, when we think of falls, we think of older adults, in part because they may be more prone to side effects due to decreased clearance of the medications, or more likely, just generally, also more likely to be on med uh, multiple medications. So the first one I have are allergy medications. These are antihistamines, and some of these can cause some of that drowsiness, especially with those first generations like Benadryl. So anybody that's ever taken Benadryl knows that it makes you sleepy. And then the next day, some oftentimes people still feel sleepy afterwards. So that's one thing to note that can increase a person's um, uh, risk for falls as well. Additionally, these antihistamines, some of them have those anticholinergic effects, including the Benadryl. So it can cause um, inability or blurred vision, so not being able to see as well. So the pupils become more dilated and the eyes fail to completely adapt. So that results in that blurry vision. Additionally, these anticholinergic side effects include um, having some urinary retention, and that uh, can also impact falls as well. So I have here on the slide, there are three images. These are all over-the-counter products that we commonly see, and these all have antihistamines. That's the component that helps people fall asleep. Um, and the thing about this is that what I really wanted to address is that these are over-the-counter products that anybody can have in their homes. So it's really important to not just think about the, the prescription products, but also the over-the-counter products, especially ones that have multiple medications in them. So really turning that that package around and looking at the ingredients list and really comparing them. It can be difficult for many people as well. So really talking to a pharmacist can help with that. Um, some other medications that I have associated with falls include um, sleep medications, anxiety medications, depression medications, and then opioids and muscle relaxants. And this is because these medications can cause sedation, dizziness, or impaired motor function. So all of these can help to contribute to falls. So on the next slide, um, I have a few more medications that can contribute to falls. So this includes diuretics. So these increase urination. That means more additional trips to the restroom. And then coupled with urgency or any tripping hazards, this can lead to falls as well. And then I, we also have antihypertensives or medications for blood pressure. So if we, too, if we shoot too much, so the blood pressure medication maybe works too well, then we can have too low of blood pressure and that can cause people to feel dizzy. Additionally, these can also cause what um, Kelly had mentioned, the orthostatic hypotension. 
Um, we also have diabetes medications, which can cause too low blood sugars, and that can contribute to falls as well. And then eye ointments. Well, why is this on here? Well, essentially, they can also cause blurred vision. Just like the urinary retention medications, they can cause blurred vision, and that may contribute to the falls. Um, these are only a few of the medications that can cause or can contribute to falls. There are many more. And there are also medications that can um, cause a fall to be more impactful, such as blood thinners, which can increase the risk of a serious bleed, especially with a fall, or medications like proton pump inhibitors or imeprazole, like, um, which is also called Prilosec. And these can decrease bone mineral density. So when a person does fall, they may be at a higher risk of a fracture, and therefore the impact of a fall can be higher. Next slide. Um, and here are some other medication-related risk factors. So have the first one is multiple pharmacies and providers, because with having multiple pharmacies and providers, there may be gaps in communication. This can lead to some of the other medication-related risk factors, including having multiple medications or medications that interact with each other. Um, for the multiple medications, I included having over-the-counter products that we previously mentioned, prescription products, but also supplements. Supplements is something that we like to specifically ask for, ask about, because there can be those side effects as well as drug interactions with um, other products as well. Also, duplicate medications. As you all can think, they may have additive side effects. So thinking about those as well, and then taking medications differently than prescribed. So I wrote this specifically this way because having too many medications, especially um, or too high of a dose, especially of the medications that we spoke about previously, can may can increase the risk of falls. But you can also imagine that someone who is not having enough of their medication may not be adequately treating their condition. So especially in the case of pain, if they're still having pain, that can also result in falls as well. And then the last one I have is not understanding the medications. And this can really contribute to not knowing what side effects to watch out for, or taking it differently than prescribed. Um, and then next slide. What patients can do to reduce their fall risk includes reviewing their medications with a provider or a pharmacist to really tease out what types of side effects they may have, or if there's any drug interactions, and then address those as well. Another thing is to stay hydrated because dehydration can um, also result in falls. So staying hydrated to prevent that. And then reporting problems. So if they're having side effects or if they're noticing things that are changing or they're worried about potential fall risk, making sure that they're relaying that to someone and expressing that so they can have help. And then also keep moving. So many of the things that Kaylee had mentioned earlier about um, exercise and so forth. And then checking vision and feet. Um, and really the feet one is really important because making sure that people have um, footwear that is not only comfortable, but appropriate for, for regular walking as well. And then making the home safer. And we'll get into a little bit about these environmental factors later on as well. And then also learning how to fall safely and what to do if they have fallen. Next slide. And then this next slide goes over what pharmacists can do for patients. So we can help to organize their medications to make it easier for them to remember to take them and then to make sure that they don't take too much or too little of their medications at a specific given time. And then also explaining the use and possible side effects of medicines and monitoring their blood pressure. This is something that Keely had mentioned earlier, um, but pharmacists are able to monitor blood pressure and uh, relay that to the patient as well. And then screen patients. And I'll talk about this in a little bit as well, but reviewing their medications and identifying interactions is a large portion of it and also taking all of that information and coordinating their care with their provider. So if there are any um, interactions that they have identified, then that's something that we can reach out to the provider to address as well. Next slide. So what can you do for patients? And this is where that screening comes into play, and it's, this is where that study, um, those study questions come into play as well. So you can ask them, have you fallen in the last year? Do you feel unsteady on your feet? And are you worried about falling? These are very simple, just these three questions. You can ask it. And if they said yes to any of these questions, then recommend them to speak to their support system and provider to make sure that we're addressing some of those issues and can reassess um, why they feel that way. 
And then the last thing is providing resources and tools to patients so they can reduce their own risk. Um, so next slide. So what exactly are those tools and resources? So the first one I have is the CDC study initiative, and this is um, one of the ones that Kelly had went into depth about, but I have it listed there. Um, the next one is the NIH calls and falls prevention as well. The next two are generally geared towards um, older adults, so the National Council on Aging, and then the King County Fall Prevention Coalition. That one I like in particular because it is very specific to the area. And there's some nice handouts on there as well. Um, and then the, the DOH Older Adults Falls. The last one I have is a No Falls at All handout um, that Kelly Roth had made. And so it includes a home safety checklist, which we'll go into in the next slide. But the front of it, you can see on the right side, it has a few statistics on there. It asks those three questions. And then it also has those things that patients can really do. So once again, reviewing your medications, keep moving, making the home safer, speaking up, and then checking vision and feet as well. So next slide. Um, so this is the backside of that. So that's the home safety checklist. What I like about this is that it really focuses on modifying the environmental risk factors um, that were previously mentioned. And these are categorized into components of the home that these modifi modifications can occur. As pharmacists, we are heavily focused on medications, but we also want to make sure that when we are assessing a patient, it's not just about the medications. There are so many factors outside of medications that need to be addressed as well. And we don't want to um, have medications cover up a problem that already exists. So making sure that we look into other things like these environmental factors, as well as a key part of what we'd like to do. So for this falls prevention checklist, we have lighting. So making sure there's adequate lighting um, and having such as having night lights throughout the house, especially in walkways from the bed to the bathroom. This is really important if they're on medications that can increase urination. So like diuretics, for instance, and then keeping good lighting all over the house. Um, and making sure those lights are accessible. The next component is staircases and hallways. So making sure there's handrails on both sides of the staircase so that they feel steady when they're going up and feel balanced as well. The next part is bathrooms and toilets. So installing those grab bars, bathrooms in general are slippery and especially the tub. And so making sure there's things to grab onto so that they um, feel steady within the bathroom, especially transitioning from the bathtub to the rest of the bathroom as well. Um, the next portion is floor. So removing mats and throw rugs, these are all tripping hazards. Um, and then removing furniture or objects that obstruct walkways. So making sure there's open walkways for, um, for people as well. And then also securing any electrical cords. Other things, the most important one, or is, well, some of the most important ones include um, non-slip shoes indoors, and then keeping an updated list of medications as well and then phones within reach. In case someone does fall, then they can call for help. And these are some of the fall prevention um, things that people can do, but really these resources are not just for your clients, not just for your patients, but really something that you can share with anybody. Uh, the wording here may be a little bit more geared towards older adults, but definitely these are all things that people can do to help to prevent falls for themselves as well. So next slide. Um, so then the next portion, we'll hop into questions. Thank you, Yip. Um, I am so grateful for your expertise. Um, it's just amazing. And as, as you can see, not only is Kelly passionate, uh, Yip is also so passionate and has just done an incredible job with our senior drug education program. And again, applause to you, Yip, um, as well as Kelly. We do have time for questions, and we have one question 